So good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Mellis and I work with the Global Catholic Climate Movement, which is also known as GCCM. You're all very welcome to this online series for Lent called Global Healing. No doubt you are all here this evening because you are concerned about what's happening to the home we all share, our common home, this planet Earth. And through these six evenings during Lent, we will be using the global healing documentaries to explore this urgent issue so that we can grow in awareness to the cry of the earth and to explore the call of faith communities in addressing this environmental crisis which we all face. We have a great lineup of speakers to help us on this journey over the next six weeks, as well as you, the participants, to share your wisdom and knowledge with each other. This series of Global Healing is brought to you by the Laudatus animators who are based in the UK. And these animators are people who've completed some training with GCCM and who are passionate about sharing the wisdom of Laudatus Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment with their local communities. We'll be hearing more from them and about them during the course of these next few weeks. So, as it is our first session this evening, there is a little bit of housekeeping before we start. And as you can see, there's many people on this call this evening. Um, we're at 430 already. Um, so that's quite a lot of people on a Zoom meeting. So in order to help things run smoothly, we would ask that you please keep your microphone muted um, unless you're invited to unmute for some reason during the session. We'd also recommend that when we're playing videos this evening, there'll be two short videos and um, that you turn off your camera. This will help with the live streaming of the recordings. We are recording parts of this session. So if you do not want to appear on a recording, also turn off your camera. If there's anyone under 18 in the session this evening, I just ask that you would identify yourself by sending one of our co-hosts a private message in the chat box. So Alex is one of our co-hosts. And if you could send Alex a private message, just to identify yourself if you are under 18, this will help us with the, with the facilitation of the, of the breakout rooms. So just the format of this evening, shortly we're going to begin with, with some prayer time and with a welcoming message from Bishop John Arnold from Salford Diocese, who's also the Bishop for the Environment. We'll move into watching Global Healing Session 1. And then we are delighted to have Dr. Carmen de Gray from Durham University with us this evening as well to, to share some, some reflections with us. We're hoping for a uh, breakout rooms to, to function and to allow us to have some discussion in smaller groups. Um, we are at the mercy of the technology, however, so hopefully that will happen. Um, and then back together for, for a short Q&A and, and a wrap up at the, at the end. So just to say you're very welcome again to this series uh, for Lent. And I will hand over now to Colette Joyce from Westminster Diocese, who is going to lead us in some prayer. prayer. And we're going to begin every session praying, using voices from around our diocese. And tonight it's the turn of Sumpto and Nandi from the Clifton Diocese. So I will liturgically invite them to unmute and to lead us in prayer. We, the next generation, are calling you to pray for the earth. We begin by recalling the beauty of creation. How amazing the world, how amazing this world we have been given. But our world is fragile. The book of Genesis tells a story of how all life was in danger. But God called Noah to protect the animals and his family from the flood. And God gave the earth back into the care of humanity when the danger was over. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. 
God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. God promised not to destroy the earth. And now we must make the same promise to God. We will care for and protect this earth. We will care for the fish, the birds, the animals, every living creature. We will care for each other. We are sorry for all the damage we have done. We are sorry for our failures to, pro to provide protection. We are sorry for the times when we have taken more than we needed. Jesus went into the wilderness to pray. And every Lent, we join him in our own wilderness. In this time of prayer, fasting and almsgiving, help us to pray for the whole of creation. Help us to fast from too much consumption. Help us to give, help us to give of, help us, help us to give of our time and our resources to care for the common home. When he returned from the wilderness, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Help us to hear these words today and leave them out in our lives. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for leading us in prayer this evening as we begin this journey on global healing. So for our next part this evening just to say bishop john unfortunately he had hoped to be here but unfortunately due to a bereavement he is unable to join us live this evening and he sends his sincere apologies but he has kindly sent us a very special recorded message to launch these lenten global healing sessions so we will share that message with you now hello I have great pleasure in welcoming all of you attending the first webinar in this series on global healing. Although in many ways, it is of course preferable to be able to gather and meet in person. The present circumstances and restrictions actually mean that we can meet together with people who are at a great distance, even internationally, who would not be able to get to a physical venue. As we begin this series, May I say that I'm very grateful to the Laudato Si animators whose idea it was to have a series of webinars during Lent. For Christians, the season of Lent is a particularly important time for reflection, from which we would hope to emerge with a sense of renewal and purpose. For all of us, of every faith and none, the concern for our environment, our care for our common home, for its creatures, plant life and people, calls us to change and heal the damage that we've done. Although there was a sense of expectation about the publication of Laudato Si by Pope Francis in 2015, I don't suppose that anyone could have anticipated its impact and lasting importance. It has become the most widely publicised papal document ever. We had been informed that the document would concern the environment but it concerned so much more. Pope Francis has a real gift in communicating the connectedness of everything. Yes, certainly the document spoke about the environment and the damage that we're doing to it, which is manifesting itself in climate change. But it also spoke about our common responsibility to care for this planet as our common home and to recognise the care we must always have for all our brothers and sisters. What we may do in the global north has an impact elsewhere and affects everyone. The document had an immediate impact that went well beyond the Catholic Church. There were reactions from politicians, industrialists, environmental groups and faith leaders, and the outcry for an urgent practical response has continued to grow. It would be wonderful to say that five years on, we are now repairing the damage that we've done, but sadly, that is not yet the case. An international alliance of nations has grown, but political action has varied, 
and not yet achieved and maintained the radical actions which are required. The notable rejection of the need for action, particularly by Brazil and for a while by the United States, is particularly frustrating, given the impact that both those nations have on the global context. And there are still, rather incredibly, the climate change deniers, despite the rapidly growing and very real evidence. Why is this all happening now in our generation? Well, for centuries we lived in reasonable coexistence with our planet and its creatures and plant life. We did not have the means on such a scale to radically disturb the very delicate balance of nature. The environment was not a subject that needed attention and consideration. Indigenous peoples had learned to live in accord with their surroundings, as many of them still do in the rainforests and on the plains. But with the coming of industrialization, the growth of population and the ever-present greed to grow the economy, to produce, to have more and waste more, the development of technology, we have been increasingly damaging nature. It seems that we did not notice the impact that we were having for about 150 years after the beginning of our period of industrialization, particularly through our use of fossil fuels. Only then did some people begin to ask about and measure the consequences of our actions, the warming of the planet, the destruction of the biodiversity of nature, the impact on seasons and its inevitable consequences for agriculture. We discovered that we had entered the sixth mass extinction, the first of our own making. Certainly, this is a matter for us Catholics, as the Bible insists time and time again that we are entrusted with the wonders of creation. The psalmist prays the glory and blessing of every aspect of our world. Jesus uses plants to illustrate his parables, the vine, the fig tree, the mustard seed and the sower going out to sow the seed. We are guardians of its well-being. But the truths of nature, the care of our planet, our common home, is for everyone's concern and responsibility, whether it is seen in religious terms or not. I hope that this series will help us all to reflect on the reality of our situation, the urgency that is needed to begin to repair the damage, and the practical part that each and every one of us can play in caring for our brothers and sisters and our common home. We have the knowledge and the technology to heal the wounds. Together, we really can make the changes and secure the future for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Bishop John for those words to set us on our, on our journey this Lent, and we send our, our wishes to him this evening also. So next this evening, we are going to enter into the first part of the Global Healing documentaries. These documentaries are available on the Catholic Bishops for England and Wales website. We'll be sharing that link um, with you later on um, for you to, to share widely locally. But for this evening, I just invite you to, to sit back for the next nine minutes um, and to take in the, this first session, which is all about the beauty of creation. And as I said later on this evening, we will be entering into some breakout rooms for discussion about what we have seen and heard this evening. So maybe just take a moment to pay attention to what stands out for you in this first session of Global Healing. On the 18th of June 2015, Pope Francis gave the world a great gift, the encyclical Laudato Si, on care for our common home. By doing this, he moved all of us Catholics, in fact all Christians, to the very heart of the ecology debate that is raging around us today. This was no surprise. From the very outset, Francis made it clear that the two central themes of his pontificate would be care for the poor and care for nature. 
Laudato Si is a, a game shifter because first of all addresses every single person in the planet. It's the first time a Pope does that. The Pope's just zoomed out and said, you know what, in Catholic teaching, society is the whole family of creation under God. He's talking about environment in the same breath as he's talking about the dignity of people, the way that we civilize our world in a true and proper sense. There is no separation between creation and salvation. Everything comes into being through Christ, for Christ, in Christ, because of Christ. It's going to Christ. The title Laudato Si comes from St. Francis's Canticle of the Creatures, which praises God for the beautiful gift of our common home, planet Earth. He calls it our sister with whom we share our life. By choosing the name Francis, he reminded the world of the great insight and challenge given to each one of us by St. Francis of Assisi. Our entire material universe speaks to us of God's love and his boundless affection for us. I have worked here at Eden for 17, 18 years now. Very exciting place to be. And currently I look after the Mediterranean biome and I work in horticulture. So very much to do with the operational horticulture, what people come to see, the, the plants that are around, the exhibits, that sort of thing. When people come to Eden, they do get to see a huge array of God's creation all in one place. I guess my love of creation started when I was very little. So I was really lucky because I grew up in a rural area on a farm. So I had wild areas around me. I'd open the window and look down through the valley, across the woods, and it was just there. And I've continued to just love particularly plants and being out in nature. I think for me, creation is just something that's always around. It's something that I enjoy and I feel part of it. And when I look at it, it would be difficult for me to even possibly imagine that there wasn't a creator there behind it. It's so awesome. The detail amongst it and the extremes that you see, the diversity, how can it possibly all just be there by accident? Just each and every part of creation just turns you back to the creator that made it. Dante said, the force that moves the planets is the love of God. We like to think it's the laws of physics. Okay, the laws of physics are the way that the love of God moves those planets. But the actual motive power, it is the love of God. When we begin to love creation, we can respond to it in a very different way. And they don't want to misuse it or destroy it or just throw it away after one use. There's some little fish swimming around that none of us have ever seen and none of us ever will see, which has no earthly use to us. That is made by someone with love. When Jesus talks about us being worth more than a sparrow, that only makes sense if he already thinks that the sparrow is of value. When you walk out of the door in the morning into a world that is creation, it is not the same world. It's a world which is kind of pulsating with beauty and, and power and an invitation to, to know somebody. I really like reading in the Bible the first job description that's written in there, where in Genesis, God says that he put man in the Garden of Eden and his job was to be the gardener. God put Adam there to care and to tend for creation. That needs to be our job as well, caring and tending. God didn't put it there just for us to help ourselves and turn around and walk away. 
God put in two types of plants. He put in plants to provide for us for food, but he also put in beautiful plants, plants for Adam and Eve to enjoy. God loves what he has created. And he, he loves us so much that in his redemption, he's asking, I want you to love my creation as I love them. That means that when we look at other creatures, we are not looking at furniture. We're looking at brothers and sisters. Now, in the, in the Catholic Church of the past, we had nothing to learn from other species. The only thing we had to learn from was our Bible and spiritual direction and things like that. So he is actually talking about the beginnings of a new spirituality in the Catholic Church. And that is extraordinary. But it's not as if Pope Francis is actually the first one to speak out about the environment and about climate change and global warming. The gift of Pope Francis to us is that he's connected everything up. Faith is not something just about prayer over there or about the environment over here. They're all connected in one great plan. Pope Francis reminds us passionately that nature is a magnificent book through which God speaks to us so that we may come to know our maker. This planet Earth is not just a commodity or a location, but a beautiful home for plants, animals and humans. Although the Pope is calling us to revisit the ageless wisdom of St. Francis, he is not unaware of the present-day reality of our planet. He powerfully reminds us of exactly what is happening before our very eyes. For the first time in the history of the planet, we are uh, affecting, because of the way we live, we are affecting the biodiversity and we are affecting nature in an unprecedented and very risky way. Through a burning of fossil fuel, we are sending gases into the atmosphere, just heating up our planet. First thing he talks about air pollution, but he tells you about what's happening with air pollution. When he talks about climate change, he talks about the reality of climate change. Clearly, the Pope shares the concerns that our planet is vulnerable. And I think more importantly, that the people of this planet are vulnerable to the effects of climate change. I've stood in places on the seashore where farmers have told me that they've lost their farms into the sea in recent years because of global warming. It's people losing their livelihoods and we've got to ensure that we're changing our world so that no one is deprived of that basic dignity and their sustainable livelihoods in their own homes. So quite a powerful few minutes and sometimes this can be overwhelming and there's a lot to take in, but maybe just to pause here for a moment and to just bring to mind something that stood out for you um, as you watched that part one of Global Healing. And there were a couple of questions which, which popped up um, on, on the screen there and we will be sharing those again with you before we go into the breakout rooms. Um, how you experience, how do you experience the gift of creation and how do you feel about the state of our planet? But before we go into that uh, discussion space, I'm delighted to, to introduce Dr. Carmody Gray, who's going to, to speak with us now. Dr. Carmody is, is currently Assistant Professor of Catholic Theology at Durham University. She works mainly in the areas of philosophical theology and theological ethics with a focus on science, nature and the environment. Carmody is also a visiting fellow at the Laudatio Institute 
in Oxford and currently working on philosophy and the theological ethics in relation to agriculture. Carmody is also involved with two organisations as an advisor to Earthwatch and Necton. So Dr Carmody, you're very welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. And we'll hand over to you now to, to hear some words and some thoughts from you. So if you'd like to unmute there. Sorry. <clears throat> there we go. Can everyone hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Um, thanks, Jane, for that introduction. Um, it's really, really good to be with you all. I've got, I've got you on gallery view to try and see as many of you as possible. I can't see all 420 of you, um, but I wish I could. And as someone who normally complains about Zoom, um, it's quite special, actually, to be able to have such a large gathering, a much larger gathering than we'd likely have in person. So I'm really grateful for that. And it's wonderful to see you all. Um, when I'm invited to, to say some words on these subjects, it's easy to think that the most helpful thing for us to do is to recite the data about the terrible things that are happening in, in our world to our, to our natural systems. Um, and it's probably true that we can't be reminded often enough about what's happening. And as Pope Francis says in Laudato Si, it's extremely easy to uh, bury our heads in the sand because they're very scary truths. Um, but I actually don't really want to talk about that now. I think all of us in this meeting are probably here because we do know what's happening and we want to do something about it. What I'd like to do is address briefly the question of what difference it makes if in the, in, in the cause of addressing um, these uh, terrifying changes, what difference it makes if we're a person of faith. Sometimes I get the impression when I listen into the conversation in the church that, um, or in the churches, I should say, that people think that faith doesn't really add anything to the secular, the wider secular conversation, that actually really we just need to join in a movement that's already happening and that we need to kind of mobilize people of faith because, because they're out there. I don't think that that's true. I think that faith brings what is perhaps the most significant ingredient to the conversation about environmental change. So I want to say a few words about that. And if I have time, maybe I'll say a few words about the particular contribution of um, Catholic faith or Christian faith to that. Um, in the period of my life, two things have happened. Firstly, it's the period in which we've known about um, what's happening to the planet. So the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, started to uh, disseminate data about climate change um, in the 1980s. During that period, we've done more damage to the natural world than we ever did in the period running up to that. So just consider these two things in parallel to each other. In the time since we've known what we were doing to the planet, we've done it more and more severely and more quickly. That is to say, knowing what we were doing hasn't stopped us from doing it. Actually, it's, it's, it seems almost like the opposite. The more we've known what we were doing, the worse the problem has, come, has become, if you look at the, um, the graphs of greenhouse gas emissions, for example. This tells us something really very, very important, which I think is deeply neglected in the wider conversation, which is that um, what we lack in responding to the environmental crisis is in fact not knowledge. It's not a, it's not a deficit of information that we're suffering. And that's obvious, even if we look at our own lives, that actually knowing stuff by itself doesn't produce change. And what we need now in the wider conversation is not to recite the information again, because there's plenty of evidence now that that doesn't work and that doesn't change anything. What we need now is a reason to care about what we're hearing. The significant thing uh, that faith contributes is some kind, and it's when I say the significant thing, I mean the significant thing, it's not a significant thing, it's the significant thing that faith contributes is um, 
what to do with the information that we have, why, how we should react to it. It's one thing to hear about farmers underwater in uh, the global south and quite another thing to uh, care about that. It's quite another thing for that to mean something to me, to be more than just a number. We hear an awful lot of numbers when it comes to uh, understanding the environmental crisis. But until it becomes more than numbers, until it becomes something that we uh, are touched by, or as Pope Francis says, something that actually causes us to feel the suffering in ourselves and not just to contemplate it as a distant object, it really doesn't make any difference to our lives. The, to put this um, maybe too neatly and simply, what's missing really is not facts but values. We have plenty of facts. What we lack is the values to know how to respond to those facts. And at the risk of ever simplifying, faith is really the, the, the framework or the context which allows us to give value to the facts. It's what uh, the, the framework that tells us or shows us, maybe I should say, what's important and what we should do about it. And there's abundant evidence in the wider secular conversation that um, that's lacking. Facts are recited, but nothing changes. So if we ask ourselves as Catholics or as Christians or as people of faith, um, trying to respond to the environmental crisis, what difference does it make that I'm a person of faith? What can I give or contribute or elicit in the wider conversation? The answer is the absolutely critical ingredient, which is some understanding of the world and reality that tells me what's important and why and gives me a reason to care. And I think for, for those of us who work in this area, it's important to remember that we don't only have something to give to other Christians and other Catholics. It's not just a question of motivating and mobilizing people in our own faith communities. It's about asking what kind of contribution can my faith community make to um, actually changing people's lives, actually changing people's behavior changing people's uh, voting patterns, changing people's consumption patterns, changing people's lifestyles, because change comes from the heart, not from the head. Um, to make a, a, a general background point about faith at large, in fact, 86% um, of the world belongs to a faith community. It's by far the largest constituency um, on earth. And that's a, that's a reason, put very briefly, that's a, a strong reason for faith communities to work with each other, to work together, to mobilise the various languages that they have for articulating why the natural world matters. Um, in, a few, in just a few minutes that I have left, um, I'm much more interested in hearing all of your um, questions and comments and thoughts um, after this, but in just a few minutes that we have left, I'd like to just address the, the, the specific way that Catholic or Christian faith language frames the value of the natural world. Um, mostly what I hear um, when, when I hear people talking and thinking about this in a Christian context is that we're encouraged to think of the world as God's creation and as loved by God. Um, and that's why we should care for it. And that is, of course, absolutely true. But I think the Bible is a little bit more explicit than that, and a little bit more challenging than that, even in the way that it frames um, the value of the material creation. I'm just going to try and share my screen with you. Oh, no, I can't share my screen with you. That's OK. Um, in Christian thought and language about the natural world, the most significant single thing that we're told about it in the New Testament is that absolutely everything that exists, including the material world and the natural world, is in Christ. We're not told only that, that human beings are in Christ, but that the world, the, the, the cosmos as a whole is in Christ. And when the New Testament imagines the, the purpose and the object and the scope of um, the saving work of God in Christ, it doesn't talk only or exclusively or even primarily about human beings it talks about uh the, in fact the the greek word that is used to describe the object of christ's work is panta which means everything everything there is it's a word that is supposed to be kind of coextensive with with reality as a whole 
So there's no there's no sense in which Christ's work or Christ's concern or the effect of of Christ's incarnation and uh, passion and resurrection and so on. There's no sense in which that's local. It's not like Christ comes to planet Earth and everything that he does concerns just planet Earth or just the human communities. In the New Testament, Christ somehow embraces the whole cosmos and the impact of Christ, the um, outcome of Christ's work is cosmic in scale. So when we contemplate the natural world and we consider its value and what our responsibilities are to it and how we should, if you like, how we should feel about it, we're really not talking just about something that's kind of outside of the specifically Christian aspect of things and that's just a sort of general presence of God distributed through the world and we should really try to look after it because of that. It's not like that at all. The New Testament tells us quite explicitly that absolutely every single thing that exists holds together in Christ. So there's nothing that we see that is not in Christ. And that means that there's nothing that we see that is not personal. Even if it looks like it has nothing to do with human communities, like the coal under the earth or the fish at the bottom of the sea that no one will ever see, that will never be in use to anyone. It's all in Christ. It's all personal. It all is somehow embraced and penetrated by a personal presence. That's uh, how Pope Francis puts it in, in Laudato Si. It's an extremely challenging thing to think and feel um, if we contemplate what, it, what difference would it make if we related to everything as though it was in Christ. It would be extremely difficult for us to behave in the ways that we customarily do. Um, incredibly brief closing thought. I'm relatively convinced from my conversations and experiences um, of working with different groups about this, that most people are not behaving in the way that they are because they don't care. They're behaving the way they are because they don't see the consequences of their actions clearly. And an awful lot of the effects of our lifestyle, especially in the developing world, is um, invisible to them. And I have great faith in people's capacity to react when they see what they're actually doing. And I think as a uh, as a way forward for sharing the vision, the the the, the vision of faith, um, the more explicit we can be, and that means uh, words and images and uh, stories and um, uh, shared experiences about the actual effects of our actions, the more likely we are to see change. I had some examples in my um, uh, the slides I was going to show you, um, but I think one example which I want to raise explicitly is um, the experience of farmed animals, animals that human beings raise for their own use. This is an example of an area of life that none of us ever see because we never go to abattoirs. We never go to the farms, the intensive farms where animals are raised. We just see them in packets in the supermarkets. And we don't see the reality behind that. And if we did, the vast majority of us would really not want to support it. We really wouldn't want to give our money to make um, <laughs> to make that kind of industry go on. We would immediately wish and pray that it could stop straight away. But it's completely invisible to us. So making visible the effects of our actions is one practical place that we can start, both for ourselves and for um, the people that we speak to within and outside faith communities. Um, I'm going to stop there because um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. This was really just an opening, an opening few thoughts to invite your your feedback and your your own voices to to speak up. Um, and thank you again for for being here, everybody. Harmony, thank you so much. Just to say, you should be able to share screen now if you'd like. Um, Apologies, you weren't able to before, or you can. Yeah. Keep okay. I'll, I'll I'll briefly I'll yeah. briefly share. Um. So these are some of the texts that I typically use. New Testament texts. Um, they're really a selection off the top of my head. It's not supposed to be a systematic survey. They're just some of the um, 
expressions that, that that drift around my mind when I think about how the New Testament imagines um, the relationship of the cosmos to Christ. The next slide has the key phrase in bold. It's hard to, um, <laughs> I find it hard to take in the the significance of these of these claims. They seem absurdly grand, but they are there in the New Testament. That's exactly what we're given. The image on the right here is um, a 13th century fresco, which shows Christ against the background of the cosmos. And um, the Greek text says the Pantocrator, which means the ruler of all. Um, this only goes to show that the understanding of Christ as having a cosmic role, being a saviour who impacts the cosmos as a whole, um, is, is in no way new. On the contrary, it's extremely ancient and it's only been forgotten in the past, well, centuries anyway. Uh, and it's really high time that we brought it back again because it would help us to recover the scale of the imagination that the New Testament asks us to have about the significance of our faith. Um, this is a, an example of one of the realities that we don't see, which is behind some of the choices that we make in the supermarket. Um, the, the number of animals living in these conditions at any one time absolutely beggars belief. And if we knew that, I think that we wouldn't pick up the packets of meat from the supermarket in the way that we do. But the fact is that we don't, and the industry um, has every motivation to keep us from seeing this, because um, it's horrifying. Uh, sorry to show you such a, such a sad and gruesome picture, but it's better that we know what we're doing so we can choose not to. Thanks, Jane. Thank you so much, Carmody. Um, those images are are startling, um, and and the phrases from the New Testament are are powerful. So, we've certainly um, we've certainly been given plenty to think about this evening. Okay, so as we've a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic, um, we'll try and 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 group these together and just for the next few minutes address some of them to to Carmody. Um, so let's see. Um, so Carmody, just a few questions around the image you showed. Um, some people are wondering, are, are pigs kept in cages like the ones you showed in, in this country, in the UK? And are you, are you advocating veganism or more ethical farming? Um, so we might just group th those two questions together, if you wouldn't mind. Pigs, thank you for these questions. Um, pigs are not kept in cages like that in the UK. It's now illegal. Um, in theory, it's illegal in the EU, but it still goes on. Um, there are, however, between 70 and 90 million pigs in cages like that in China on any one day. To give you one example. That's just one statistic. Um, the statistics on farmed animals uh, in this country are nevertheless shocking. Uh, barn reared hens, for example, live terrible, terrible lives. Um, much of what passes for free range doesn't involve any of the sorts of images that we have in our minds when we think of free range. It's really worth finding out what's actually involved um, in these labelings. I would like to suggest and, and strongly recommend a fantastic organisation, I'll put it into the chat, called Creature Kind. Creature Kind is a charity that focuses on um, supporting churches in awareness of farmed animal welfare. Um, they produce a really great resource, which you can request from them, go to their website, which will help you to um, understand and interpret food labeling for your church and also help you to see what the impacts are of your different choices. Um, 
it's worth, I'm about to address this other question in a second, but it's worth saying that, of course, when most of us think of animals we and, and our relationship with animals, we tend to imagine wild animals, whereas in fact the animals on whom we have the most direct impact and we have the greatest power to help are in fact animals that are domesticated. And those are the animals um, who tend to suffer disproportionately from human activity. And so I always encourage people not to think quite so much about pandas and tigers, although they're fantastically wonderful and we all should hope and pray for their um, <laughs> survival and flourishing, but to think really concretely about the most proximate and intimate relations we have, we have with animals, which are the ones that we eat um, and the ones whose products we eat. So dairy and um, egg production and all that kind of thing. Um, veganism, vegetarianism, um, these are complex questions. I'll give you an incredibly brief version of my own thinking about this, which has evolved considerably. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is I think every Christian needs to think about it. It's a major area of ethical responsibility, and that's true at least, at the very least, because emissions from animal, uh, the raising of animals, contribute an absolutely enormous amount to global greenhouse emissions. And so even if we didn't have any care whatsoever for the welfare of individual animals, even as an act of global climate responsibility, eating less meat is absolutely essential. Um, that doesn't mean either vegetarianism or veganism, but it certainly means a reduction in the number of animal products we eat. In terms of vegetarian or, or, or veganism, I'm very, very hesitant about those uh, if they're presented as ethical absolutes rather than if they're presented as pragmatic responses to the climate crisis. And I'll tell you why incredibly briefly, what kind of food production a landscape supports is an incredibly contextual question. That is to say, different landscapes really are different. What kinds of food different landscapes can produce is really an important question to ask. I'll give you an example. At the moment, I'm in Switzerland. The Swiss landscape is uniquely suited to alpine grazing of cows. I live with some vegans at the moment here and the vegans are busy eating tofu from the Amazon. When there are cows, and I kid you not, a hundred meters away. Right, that's not a very good, in my opinion, ecological choice. In the same way, there are large parts of, of uh, our own country, um, the United Kingdom, where um, uh, the landscape is only suitable for, for, for pastoralism, for the grazing of animals. In those circumstances, it's strange to me to think that we shouldn't um, that we shouldn't use animals, especially when. Sorry, I'm going to stop talking about this, but this is a bit of a passion of mine. I mean, this whole question. Um, when, in many cases, the the ecological richness of those, la those landscapes is actually sustained by the creatures, by the um, the grazing practices. Um, for example, the alpine pastures in Switzerland or the downland in my home county of Sussex, which wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the grazing of animals with all of the unique species that thrive there and so on. So I think what I'm trying to say is veganism, vegetarianism, I think they're contextual questions. Everybody needs to educate themselves and ask what, how they can best take responsibility, both for the welfare of animals and for the climate. Um, I'm very happy to discuss that further when people come in um, with further questions about that but that's my kind of general take on those issues but i do really recommend creature kind i'll just put it in the chat great thank you so much carmody yeah so complex issues um i'm just going to pass over to, to john paul the key who's who's from eco Congre eco conversion group rather um and i think john paul has another question for you hello yes hi comedy thank you for your talk um hi. so I've been noticing a few things in the chat, so I'm going to try lumping a few of them together, along with um, some things that I've picked out that you mentioned during your talk. You were talking about um, making visible the effects of our actions. You know, when talking about we don't see the, the negative effect of our actions. But going back to the uh, global healing film, um, I can't help but feel that there's also the positive um, experience of um, seeing the natural world, experiencing the natural world and the effects that that would then have on us. And there's lots of questions coming through um, saying things like, I'm almost, you know, overcome by the normality of what needs to be done. Um, and, you know, it is more a case of we do not know where to begin in our daily lives with regard to care for the planet. 
once we have taken out our recycling, etc. So the question is, I think, during Lent, um, what can, how can we feel the effects um, within ourselves? How can we, um, how can we uh, feel the effect of nature of God's love with the beauty of creation and allow that to start changing us in a positive way? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, that one of the effects of modernization and industrialization on our lives, which, by the way, has gone together, of course, with urbanization, is that most of us have very little a uh, regular experience of the natural world beyond occasionally hearing the birds and going for a walk, you know, in a park. That actually the majority of us live at a considerable distance from nature. Pope Francis very, very clearly links um, actual encounters with nature with what he calls ecological conversion. We need to see what it is that we're called to love. We need to listen to what it is that we're called to love be in close proximity with it, expose ourselves to it. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the lasting, one of the lasting legacies of Pope Benedict is that what really converts the heart is beauty. God's beauty converts the heart to God and the world's beauty converts the heart to love of creation, to creation spirituality. If we really want to seek ecological conversion for ourselves and for others, we really, really need to expose ourselves to the beauty of creation, to remember what it is that we're being called to protect. That's something that may seem, um, you know, if we're not careful, that can seem like an unrealistic goal. Like we have to go and be in the great wild landscapes of the world and have encounters with, you know, elephants and rhinos in order to realize that creation is beautiful. That's not the case. We're all, we all have the possibility of encountering the beauty of nature in the immediate vicinity of our lives, even if it's as simple as watching the tree outside our window come into leaf. The different, the thing is not so much the scale and the drama, it's the tenderness and the quality of our attention to what's, to, to, to um, natural processes and natural lives. Um, so, yes, Lent, absolutely a time for reconnecting with the natural world, for seeing the natural world as indwelt, by the Holy Spirit as embraced by Christ, as holding together in Christ, as having its meaning towards Christ and from Christ and for Christ and really learning to have a new imagination um, in the way that we perceive creation. Um, a credibly brief further thought about that. One thing for those of us who are involved in the preparation of liturgy and the preparation of sacred spaces, I know that in COVID none of us have actually been exposed to sacred spaces and liturgies very much, but the Christian imagination needs to be formed and one of the key ways that that happens is through art and architecture and song and the whole kind of multi-sensory experience of Christian worship and Christian sacred spaces. And we learn how to value things by uh, uh, sounds and images and to summarize by beauty. So we need to think very carefully about how we use our liturgies and our sacred spaces and our music and so on to encourage and foster um, a creation spirituality. Um, final brief word on this issue of feeling overwhelmed. This is, it, this is just the universal experience of all of us when we think about the scale of these problems. We feel absolutely overwhelmed. Let me say one or two brief things about this. The first thing, please never forget that when God wanted to save the world, he came as a baby. He came as, as an absolutely minute, helpless little speck of life to an incredibly obscure part of the world, to a powerless people, to a powerless family with absolutely no resources. That was how God chose to save the world. Something very, 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 very small and very, 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 very weak. And the number of people Let's be clear, the number of people that Jesus had the opportunity to actually meet in his historical life was pretty tiny. And the devil in the temptations gave him the opportunity of grand, dramatic, spectacular, sensational scale of change, and Jesus rejected it. 
I'm not saying, by the way, that we should reject our opportunities to create great, great change. But I am saying the logic of faith in general and of Christian faith in particular is that great things happen by means of small things. So we really must, and Pope Francis is very clear about this, we really must have faith that the small and outwardly very humble acts of ecological conversion that we pursue in our own lives really do bear great fruit. That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, let us not, uh, uh, and, and what I'm about to say should be seen through the lens of what I've just said about the value of small things, let us not neglect our political and economic influence. All of us has a vote. All of us has the capacity to say to those that we vote for, are you saving the ground under my feet or not? Are you saving my food supply? Are you saving the oceans on which I depend? Are you saving my climate? Are you saving? We all have the power to exert political influence on our leaders, but very few of us uh, maximize our opportunities to do that. And that's very unfortunate. It's not just about what we choose to buy in the supermarket. It's about how far do we leverage our political power, A. B, how, this is my own personal motto about this, how I spend my money is how I cast my vote for the world that I want. Unfortunately, for better or worse, it's our power as consumers that is probably our most significant power in globalized, capitalized societies. When I spend my money, I am creating a particular future. I am supporting a particular way of living on this earth. And that's true in many, many, many ways that we don't really think about. It's not only about putting petrol in my car. It's not only about what I buy in the supermarket. It's also about where I invest my money. It's about where I go on holiday. It's about what kind of car I buy in the first place. <laughs> it's about what kind of house I buy. All of these things, the way we spend our money, we are casting a world for the kind of a casting a vote for the kind of world we want. So we do have more power than we think. But at the same time, we should never underestimate the influence that, that our small actions have. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Carmody. Um, there's a lot being said in the chat box and I can feel people's uh, passion, concern, uh, worry. Um, and with time this evening, we're not going to get through everything, but we are going to take two more questions. And I'm going to hand over to, to Ellie. Um, and if Ellie is there, Ellie? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Ellie <laughs> is also from uh, the Eco Conversion Group. So Ellie, uh, if you'd like to give a question to Karamadi, please. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I'm also going to lump a few of the questions together because there were quite a lot around this. But you've, you've already kind of touched upon it, but I'm just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail around how you propose that we communicate our vision and how we invite others in, in a way that's not sensationalizing and actually inspiring and not off-putting. So, because a lot of the things we talk about are quite negative and quite shocking. So is, do you have a vision for how that looks in inviting ways both within our, in our faith and outside it to invite people to participate? Um, great question. I feel like there are several, there are several questions there. Um, Okay, so I'm just gonna separate the questions. There's the question about how we communicate when a lot of what we seem to need to say is negative, A, and B, how in particular do we communicate as people of faith? Let's begin with the first. Um, those of you who work in education um, will know that it's relatively well known that negative psychology doesn't work very well that fear is not an especially good motivator <laughs> and that um, if we need to deliver negative information to people, the best thing we can do is deliver it in the context of positive information. Some of you might have heard um, about Michael Mann, the uh, environmentalist who spoke out recently about some of the um, influences, the global influences in the global climate conversation are vested interest in trying to prevent serious um, change to our um, fossil fuel emissions. That is to say, people who are who, who want things to stay as they are. He said a number. I urge you to look it up. It's very powerful stuff. Um, the thing that he said that is particularly relevant here is that one of the ways, counterintuitively, that these vested interests try to keep things as they are is by making people think that there's no hope, making people think that it's too late that this is the most demotivating thing that they could do. 
So I think it is a really important thing for us to consider that if we deliver only a message of apocalyptic disaster, it really what it really says to people is, well, what I what I do won't make a difference anyway, so I shouldn't do anything. And that is absolutely the wrong outcome. This connects us directly to the second point, the second question. How do we communicate our vision as people of faith? And the answer is, <laughs> it needs to be beautiful. We need to communicate the vision of creation as something beautiful, something compelling, something full of hope and promise and colour and life and energy. Because that's what actually attracts people and that's what provides the, um, the momentum for change. Is because people have something to desire. People have something to move towards that that they, that they want to see realized. And that's um, going back to what I said in my opening remarks. One of the most important contributions that faith can make is it's not just about information that we need to react to in the negative sense. It's a it's a positive vision of hope and a beautiful future. And this is what God promises. Right in the pages of Scripture, He promises every single person. A beautiful future. He promises the earth itself a beautiful future. And that promise and that hope and that beauty needs to be front and centre in what we communicate. And that's not to say, not to be shy about being pretty frank and pretty upfront about um, what we're doing to ourselves, our kind of collective act of self, massive self-harm. Uh, it's not about avoiding that, but it is about as uniquely as people of faith being able to offer people god's promises for a beautiful future for everything and everyone every creature mm. i exactly how we do that i mean i've mentioned and i think this is so underrated i've mentioned actual physical beauty the physical beauty of our worship and of our sacred spaces i think um that's universal but every person in every different context needs to figure out how they particularly in the particular work that they do whatever your field is whatever your means of influence are how you, you can communicate something that is intrinsically motivating, attracting um, people and not just um, becoming another reason for them to turn the television off because what they're listening to is too scary. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was probably too vague, but I hope that the, the kind of general, my general feeling about that is apparent. Absolutely. No, not vague at all. The, the phrase that was coming to my mind is beauty will save the world, but not not to be. That's also a vague statement, but in the sense of where Ladado C encourages us to start with our reconnection with the beauty and the awe and wonder that that is around us uh, to start from there and everything else will flow from that. Thank you so much. Um, Edward, one last question and thank you everyone for, for staying with us and we know we're over time but this discussion is just uh, so fantastic. I, I'm reluctant to let it end so we, we'll take one more question uh, for Carmen D and, and we will wrap things up then. Edward, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hiya. Thanks again Carmen D. Um, very difficult to pick out a last question there but I think a few people early on pointed out that, uh, you know, not everybody on this call is, is a Catholic. There's you know, different denominations, Christians and interfaith. And I suppose it would be quite interesting just as a, 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 a final word on the importance of, you know, working on this uh, between faiths and how important that is and what common ground do we need to find. And, you know, have you got any sort of closing reflections on that, that side of things? Um, when I was thinking, thank you, um, Ed, when I was thinking about um, what to say this evening, I was wondering whether to actually comment at greater length about the specific contribution of interfaith and interreligious activity, um, because I think this again is, is, is neglected. Um, there's lots to say about this, but I'll just focus on what I think is the fundamental thing. Firstly, just to repeat, faith in general offer something that the, uh, if you like, secular and scientific conversation simply doesn't have, which is a framework or a vision or a narrative about what this world is and what this world is for that tells us why we should care. And there is no, as it were, scientific way of deriving that. Science and a, a kind of determinedly reductionist secular conversation will never supply that. That is the specific and unique characteristic of faith communities. Um, secondly, faith communities are specialists in forming 
human beings. That is to say, forming desire, forming character. They are motivational specialists. They're specialists at getting human beings to do the things that human beings typically find the most difficult, such as self-discipline, self-restraint, generosity, compassion, community. Faith communities have at their disposal a, a unique um, uh, accumulated treasure of wisdom and experience in shaping human beings and motivating human beings. And there's a remarkable amount that faith traditions have in common in the ways that they do that. Um, I'd like to mention one thing that they have in common in particular. Uh, this sounds incredibly dull, but um, the very dullness of it is the essence of the thing. They understand that for human beings to change, what they require is not um, simply one-off decisions, but repeated decisions. That is to say, actions need to become habits. And faith communities specialize in creating habits by repetition. That's why we go to church every week and not just once a year. Um, learning how to create new habits is what faith communities can do, and they can do that together. Final thought. What is the shared, what is the single fundamental shared value of the faiths? That on which we really can um, uh, call common ground. And I think it's something like this. All the faiths share a sense that our fundamental task as human beings is to be right with reality. That is to say, right with God, right with the universe, right with the order of things, right with nature, you know, whatever the, the vocabulary is that is used in that faith, that our task is to be right with that, is to be in line with that, is to be in tune or in harmony and resonance with that. And we all think that in some sense, we are accountable to that, that we will be judged on it, that we will be held responsible somehow, that we stand or fall by that. And therefore we share the sense as faiths that our humanity is something to live up to. Yes, it's a gift, but it's also a task. And that's a source of profound unity between the faiths. We really do share the belief that our humanity is a task. It's, it's a high ideal to become fully human, to live up to that ideal. And the ways in which we um, uh, help and support and encourage people to live up to that ideal are different. But the ideal, I think, is uh, there's a fundamental continuity there. And there is no faith that doesn't see now how seriously we are failing to live up to our humanity. And the united voice of the faith communities is quite a force. And there is, there is simply no downside to sharing that task. Because the world really, really needs it. <laughs> Absolutely. Carmody, thank you so much for your, your words and your inspiration. And I think all I was struck by the statistic you mentioned where 80% of the world profess to, to be a, a believer or to be a member of a, of a faith community um, and, and that is that is a powerful force and, and we all each of us here have a role to play uh, in some way in, in addressing the crisis that our that our world faces and you've certainly given us a lot of food for, for thought this evening and we're so grateful to you for, for being with us. Um, and to everyone gathered here, um, we are over time and thank you for staying with us. Um, but I think you'll agree that, that it was certainly worth it. And to acknowledge all the questions and comments in the chat box, um, we can see your concern, we can see your passion. Um, and we're just so pleased that, that we're beginning. This is the start of a six week journey together. Um, so please remember that this is a process and a journey as, as we move through Lent um, together. Just one final um, thing to say, um, there are many Laudato Si animators behind the scenes putting this series together. And I just invite Liz uh, to unmute herself. Um, Liz and Karen have prepared a handout for each week, which will be emailed to all of you tomorrow um, to help you reflect a little bit more um, each week as, as we journey together. So I'm just gonna share one last slide with you and, and Liz will, um, Liz will give us some information. So Liz, if you're there, you can unmute. 
Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yes, okay. so we were preparing a, a weekly electronic handout for everyone, which will look like the picture you see here on the screen. Uh, it'll be a quick reminder of the key topics from each session with some suggestions for prayer, reflection and action and some recent news stories. It will contain links to more information if you'd like to follow up further. Uh, the handout, as, as we just were told, will be emailed to all of us after each session. So if you can't attend the session, you'll still receive the email. Uh, the handout will be an attachment in PDF format in simple colors, so you can look at it on your device or print it if you like. So we hope you find it valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, and thanks to Liz and Karen for, for preparing this for us each week um, also. And uh, that will be sent out to you um, tomorrow or Monday. Um, and we just invite you to, to share whatever you can with people locally. Um, this is very much a grassroots movement. Change comes from the grassroots. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. And, and you're being called somewhere um, to act act locally through through you being here this evening. I've, I've no doubt about that. Um, so just to say thank you to everyone who uh, joined us this evening. Thanks to those who prepared the prayer um, who prepared questions um, and breakout rooms. Thanks to Alex, who's, who's behind the scenes on the tech. And we're sorry that that didn't that didn't work out, but we'll see what we can do for next week. And to please come back next week, same time, same place at 7.30 um, for session two of, of Global Healing. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody, and um, have a good week. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you so much. Wonderful evening. Learned so much.